right. Welcome to the Bella Grace podcast, where we are empowering you to embrace the beautiful grace found in recovering your authentic self. And this season, we are doing that by telling stories of people who are living a sober life and having fun doing it. We are also sharing stories this season of people who grew up with alcoholic or addicted parents and how they have risen above that experience. Um, So you'll see a a big mix of stories this season. I'm super excited about each and every one of them. Uh, This week, we have my new friend, Mike. He is an author, a life coach, and a recovering addict. Welcome to the show, Mike. I'm so excited to have you. I'm excited to be here. And I'm also a public speaker. I will add that too. So there I'm we not... go. <laughs> yeah. He does all the things. All the yeah, things. I'm trying to I'm trying to get do this. This is my practice for if one day I get called a Tony Robbins stage or a TEDx, you know, this is my practice for all that. So <laughs> yeah. Well, you have an you have an incredible story. Like you yeah. shared some of it with me when we did our pre-podcast chat. And Mm -hmm. I was so excited for the listeners to hear your story because you've gone from the bottom, changed your life and are doing incredible things now. So why don't you tell us like how you got where you are today and what you're up to these days? All right. Well, I, I I guess I just, uh, you know, what I usually do is just go back to the beginning of things. And it, it, it goes back to like my first book I wrote uh, in the first chapter I said being born on the wrong side of the womb was the very first chapter and people kind of laugh at that but it, it's kind of true because when I was born my both my parents were very young my mom had just turned 19 just a couple months before I was born my biological father had just turned 17 three months before I was born uh, so they were both young both doing drugs uh, it was the 70s you know it was you know, just those times, you know, there was, uh, I think, a recession going on at the time. I was too young to remember. I don't know. Jimmy Carter was the president and all this, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway, my my biological dad was very abusive to my mother. And when I was about a year old, uh, I, it's taken me some hypnotherapy to actually remember this. But because I had family tell me that I wasn't there. But uh, my biological father set my mother's face on fire in front of me. Wow. Lord, poured cologne on her face and set her face on fire. Um, my grandparents being the good, you know, good Christian people, they didn't raise my mom that way, uh, you know, to to take that stuff. They they took her to the hospital and they had to hold her down and scrub her face to make sure she didn't have scarring and stuff, which was very excruciating and painful. So that was my first real experience with this kind of lifestyle. And then when I was two, my mom had already divorced my biological dad and met and married my stepdad when, by the time, I, just a year later. So, I mean, I did not give it time to, I mean, I think she wanted someone more to protect her. Uh, I don't know the situation, but he was the only dad I've ever known. Now, both my, when I say my dad, I mean my stepdad that raised me. He's, you know, both him and my mom have passed on now. Uh, my biological father's in prison the rest of his life. And I haven't seen him since I was two, and I'll be 45 in October, so that gives you any indication. Um, I do have other sisters that I know from him, but uh, that's only because I did the due diligence to find them. Um, But from the time I was two until I was 17 years old, my stepdad brutally abused me as, you know, and he hit me like I was a grown man. It did not matter. Even as young as two years old, uh, I've had had 67 something hospital visits before I was 16 years old. Um, I grew up in West Texas, Eastern New Mexico. So I lived in Lubbock for a long time. Uh, um, my dad was a member. He was a member of a 1% club. I should say that's down there. And uh, uh, he just, he wasn't home a lot, but when he was, you know, it, it was, that's what I, you know, I came to know. And there was a lot of times growing up that if, if he wasn't around a lot, or if he was around, he was actually being nice. I felt weird, and I kind of provoke him, you know, because that it was just weird to me. I didn't know any other life, and I can tell people that just how abusive he was in in detail, and it just jaw drops, and I'm like, what? It was normal for me, you know. That's uh, all you knew. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times I was transported to uh, the Texas Tech Hospital there in Lubbock to have my head drilled open because it was swelling because he had beat me so bad. You know, just that's what I grew up with. Both my parents did drugs openly in front of us. 
uh, growing up as kids because they wanted us to know the dangers of them. They didn't want us to do them, but they sure said, if you're going to do them, we'd rather you have them do them with us so that we, we know you're safe because, you know, they, they couldn't tell us no because they were doing it, you know. And so even at, but at 15 years old, when I started doing drugs, I, I was, you know, I knew right from wrong at that time. I knew the potential dangers of it. I knew what it could do to me. And I just, it would. It was a way, it was an escape, you know, I, it yeah. was, really was. Um, so that's when I started doing them. Well, I did quit for a while uh, to join the military to get away from my dad. And as he teared up, begging me not to go, I smiled as I was signing every one of those papers. Like, I'm out of here. I'm, you know, you ain't never. Go. Oh, the, well, boy, was that a mistake because I, you know, went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, did my basic training between my junior and senior year of high school because I started reserves. As soon as I came back, my senior year, I just before I ended my senior year, I, I transferred to active duty right before AIT. That way, you know, I, by the time I was done with AIT, I'd be active duty. And that was a mistake because as soon as I got to Fort Hood, Texas, they sent me to Bosnia. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I, went from, I went from, well, I went from Dallas to El Paso on an eight, uh, that eight hour bus ride. And then I got a 14 hour plane ride <laughs> right <laughs> after that. I, did, I didn't get no break or nothing. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So, um, but I was, in, I was in a uh, fourth infantry division and it, I'm not going to talk too much about it because it's a sore subject, but I mean, I got to give the backstory a little bit. Um, I came home and I was not the same person, yeah, not the yeah. same person at all. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I remember one night that, uh, it was my apartment because I'd already been administratively separated from the military, which I don't even understand that why they did that, but I do, but I don't. Um, but it was my apartment. My sister and brother and mom were living with me. He'd come over to visit them and he got mad at me for something. And I, I said, this is my house. You can get out any time. And, he, you know, of course, my sister and brother said the same thing. Of course, he left. Well, I said, you know what? You stay here. I'll leave. I took off walking while he come down and grabbed me and, uh, was starting to hit me and I, I just, I lost, I blacked out. I don't remember what happened. I just know when I came to, there was about four people holding on to me. And this is the first time I've ever seen this man scared of anything. And his eyes were about as big around as saucers, but I know he never hit me again. Yeah. And I said, why, why y'all grabbing me? What, what's going on here? And they're like, are you kidding me? You don't, you don't remember a thing. That's that you're nuts. And I said, no, I don't. I really don't. And it was at that time that I knew I had some issues, some really bad issues. And I mean, because I before I went to the military, the reason why I went in there was because I had these urges to to do some harm to people. And I knew they weren't natural. I didn't like it. Um, and I said, I had to do something. I had to discipline myself or something. Well, I, I got the very opportunity to to uh, satisfy those urges when I went into the military and um I mean, I even had family that used to tell me we were just having bets on when you were going to become a serial killer. That's how bad he treated me because that, I mean, that's, you know, the, statistically speaking, that's where I would have fell in line to. But, uh, and that's why I went, kind of went to the army was to try to, you know, resist some of those urges and have some self-discipline and ended up, unfortunately, having to satisfy a few of them, you know, yeah. Uh, but I, I didn't know I needed counseling. I didn't when I got home, I didn't know how to get help. I, I didn't know what to do. I was kind of lost. I just I just walked around and begged people, just somebody kill me so I don't have to. That's all I thought about was wanting to die. And uh the nightmares were and I still have the nightmares to this day. Uh, you know, I, I can't I can't get rid of those because between my dad and the military, this it's called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I can't get rid of it, uh, but I I don't let it define me anymore. Uh, I don't let it, you know, uh, I still have my good days and my bad days. And it, it usually takes me about an hour and a half to two hours in the morning to get myself together before I can speak to anybody, before I can function, uh, especially speaking to people, because I'm not completely coherent. Um, as a matter of fact, I, if, you know, there's a lot of loud noise going on outside. I live in an apartment with very thin walls. I have to keep my door locked because if I'm not, you know, fully coherent, I can't get out the door if it's locked. But if it's unlocked, I could see, I could hurt someone and not even know it. So, uh, you know, and I do have to keep in mind of that. Uh, but I, 
I definitely, that's why I don't sleep a lot of even sober because I, I work, you know, cause I'd rather not sleep and have to go through that. Cause I can stay awake. I can go on eight hours of sleep a week. <laughs> I, I do get exhausted and tired, but you know, like earlier, I was just about to go. All, I said, wait a minute. No, I got a podcast. dude. I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's a struggle some days, but some days it's most days I've, I've found that inner peace and the happiness within and found some purpose. So I, I really don't, you know, let it get to me. But when I have my bad days, I, I will isolate myself and I will get through it because I can't, I can't interact with anybody like that, especially if there's a lot of chaotic stuff going on because I'm, I'm not physically here. I'm in a yeah. different place. So, you know, it, it's very hard to explain to people that when I'm just zoned out and you, you're calling my name and I can't, I'm not talking to you. Don't keep talking to me because you might trigger something that, you know, cause I'm not, I'm not here. For, I'm physically here, but I'm not in this place. I'm not. Yeah. You're mentally well, somewhere home. else. Yeah. yeah you were mentally somewhere else. And that's like a huge component of PTSD and not mm-hmm. to mention, you probably had a little bit of big, a little bit of PTSD that you didn't even realize you had from the experience with your biological father. That- that's exactly it. And that, you yeah. know, this was all going on. Um, they used that excuse when I left the military, why they administratively separated me was the PTSD, that they didn't catch it during my military enlistment physical. Uh, I know better. It was because uh, whistleblowing, I believe, honestly, because that's one of the uh, wars that they still haven't declassified anything yet. And they won't even talk about it in the United States. So um, I, I honestly know the truth. But uh, but that's the excuse they used was because yeah. of my PTSD. They called yeah. it uh, battle or battle fatigue back then. Mm-hmm. When, you know, uh, it yeah. wasn't it? They said, yeah, but, you know, you you show signs and symptoms like you've been in war for 20 years. And I said, I have been in war for 20 years. You know, yeah, your body has really been. Have. Yeah. Um, I, I lived in survival mode the whole time. And they, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you, I can't, I said, I'm not going to go through it all and explain it because you wouldn't believe me anyway. You know, yeah. um, as a matter of fact, years later, when I ended up in prison at 40 years old, talking to the prison psychologist, I had to have him call my aunt to verify it because he did not believe the stuff I was telling him. He thought yeah. I was making it up. And he was like in shock that he's like, why would you say stuff like that and lie like that? I'm like, you really think I'm making a story up? I said, here, I give you a number. You call my aunt. And she said, if that boy saying it, you need to believe it. That is true. He's not exaggerating. Um, but, you know, I, I knew. And when I hit my 20s, I moved, we'd moved to Michigan. And because uh, for a fresh start, I didn't have a childhood. So at 20 something years old, I go there and I find a, you know, a $12 an hour job at the time. And at that time for a 20 year old, that was good money. and you know, I worked 40, 50 hours a week and I had more money than I would, what I knew what to do with. I had a little truck that cost $5 to fill up because gas was 98 cents at the time, <laughs> you know, and I made like a thousand dollars a week, just about almost, you know, because I was a single man and you're 20 years old. That's a bad, bad, bad thing to have is money that you can't spend. <laughs> yes. Unless you know how to save it. I yes. never been taught that. Nope. Yeah. My dad passed away when I was eight and we got a huge settlement um, from his death. And when I turned 18, I all of a sudden had access to the entire trust fund. Well, a chunk of it because they set it up so that I would get it in annuities. Um, But I had close to $80,000 in the early 2000s. As an 18 year old, exactly 10 years after my dad died, full blown addiction to meth. Um, yeah, <laughs> I got access to it the day after I graduated high school, like literally graduated that night. Next morning, I woke up with it was $55,000 in my checking account, plus and some I, other money that I had to, was waiting to come in. Yeah. And yeah. I could see the rabbit hole. You fell right down. I <laughs> uh, sure did. I do you, pride. I do pride myself on the fact that I didn't spend a penny of my dad's money on drugs. I always said that, like, I won't spend it on drugs, but I damn sure did spend it at Walmart tweaking my butt off. <laughs> right. Well, and you know what the, the funny part about that is, is I was I, I knew about meth beforehand because I had family that dealt with it, and I. I you know, got, I've always been in this criminal lifestyle. I, that's all I've known, except for when I went in the military. That was the only time I had any structure. But the minute I got home, 
it was like there was nobody there you know nobody knew i i lost all that that camaraderie that brotherhood so i was lost so i turned it you know man well years later here i'm in michigan and 20 years old making all this money i started getting tattoos everywhere you know i i, I went to a bar every night of the week and then i met i met lady h Oh, yes. Yes. Well, at, mind you, I, because of my pain issues, I'd been on a uh, standing order for uh, Vicodin 10, the thousand milligrams for mm -hmm. 120 of them for like 10, 15 years. And I did heroin for the first time and I really liked it. But I'm like, you know, I can't afford this right now because I'm I'm out here I'm partying. I've got all these girls going. And I, I let me tell you what, I'm surprised I never caught nothing to be in my 20s because I was very reckless. When I say I did everything to the extreme, I mean, I pushed the absolute limits of life itself in hopes that, you know, something would take me out because nothing else had. My dad hadn't. The military hadn't. Let me tell you what people tried. And they tried over the years and it, they tried it in the last few years. And, it, you know, I'm just like, I must have some kind of purpose here because there's been a lot of pretty badass men that have tried to, you know, remove me from this world and couldn't get her done. I'm not saying that I'm the, you know, just the baddest man on the planet, but, uh, you know, I've survived a lot. But so I, I left that alone for a while, but I, I always continue to do the meth. And I, you know, I, when I was 25, I went back to college and I went through a medical assisting program in nine months. I've always known I've been smart. I, I've taken the men's IQ tests and they scored 145, like five different times. Okay. I know I'm not a stupid person. I know the streets. So that's a very dangerous combination. And I used it to my advantage very well. Um, I was you know, very affiliated. I knew people, you know, I, you know, I earned my respect. I was, I followed my dad's footsteps. I joined motorcycle clubs. I lived that lifestyle. Well, come along about, I'm say 30 years old now, 32 years old. And I'm on my third wife by this time. <laughs> and, uh, I have a $30 an hour job doing good. Uh, you know, I'm getting, but I'm still getting high because I haven't dealt with none of my, you know, I, because I've been through counselors, I've been through psychiatrists and they all tell me the same thing. Well, you just got to do this. This is your coping skills and send you on your way three days and you're done. You know, I'm like, what the hell good is this helping me? Yeah. And we talked about the fact that like, um, I think it was you and I, that we were talking about like, once the drugs get out of your system, you still have to detox your mind. Yes. And a lot yeah. of those rehab centers, like outpatient, inpatient, whatever, you go through detox, you get 30 days of treatment, 26, whatever your insurance pays for, whatever the state will pay for. And then they send you on your way. Well, we didn't get sick overnight. Oh. Our addictions were years in the making, like years. Oh. And it you know, takes and years for us to undo that twisted thinking. And the, <laughs> and the whole bad part about it is, uh, and I have to go back just a little bit because I missed a crucial part. When I was married to my second wife, this is long when I had my surgery because I was stabbed in the stomach and uh, I had a gastric sleeve surgery. I was 430 pounds. I was in still in pain a lot. I lost 200 pounds in eight months when they did this surgery because when I was stabbed in the stomach, I, I mean, they had to remove a lot of my stomach. to So they did the gastric sleeve. Well, I finally started losing a lot of weight, but I was still in immense pain because I've been carrying all this weight for so many years. And the I was eating 120,000 uh, or 10 milligram Norcos in 10 days, 120 of them in 10 days. You know what that did to my liver? I mean, I, I had fatty liver for a while and almost was pushing cirrhosis. A buddy of mine comes over and says, man, I said, I'm just hurting. I can't move. And I'm, I, I, I went to work every day. You know, I worked at True Green. I worked, I walked 10, 15 miles a day. You know, I wore out three pair of boots a year doing that job. Um, he says, here, we'll try this. And he hands me this brown chunk. And I, I said, is that heroin? He says, yeah, but he says, just do you a little bit. He goes, you'll feel so much better. I snorted that first line and I jumped up. I could I could move. I was fluid. I literally went from snorting a line or two here to shooting three grams a day in two months time and still would was able to go to work. I could function. I could work and I get all my stops done. I was selling programs at work. I was I'd sell five thousand dollars in programs in a week and I got commissions off that plus do all my stuffs and, you know, on this stuff. So I it really hit me hard. Yeah. And it really hit me very hard to where like 
you know, my, my second wife, we were getting divorced at the time. And I, like, I would wake up in the morning and if I, if he hadn't delivered to me the night before, I had to meet him somewhere during the day at work to get it. So that way I could not be sick because it was physically making me sick. And I said, I cannot be like this. This is going to, this is going to kill me one day. And so it was about two or three months later, I just got sick of waking up sick like that and that feeling and shivering cold and just, and still having to go to work like that sometimes. And sometimes it might be, you know, six to eight hours into my 12 hour day before I ever got a hold of it. Yeah. Or my, my guy. And, uh, I said, no, I can't do this. So I uh, I took a month off, a month leave of absence. And I told my brother, I said, you go to my house. I said, I'm going to sit at yours because I'd given him his house. And I sat in his bathroom for a month. I said, just come check on me at least once a day. Just you. I said, that's it. That other night, leave me alone. And I sat in that bathtub for a month, puking and shit on myself, going through the most horrific withdrawals and quit cold turkey off heroin. And I did that for a reason, even though the doctor told me I could have killed myself. I said, yeah, yeah it's I, dangerous. Was gonna, <laughs> I was going to either die or I was going to make my body so violently ill that when I even looked at heroin after that, it would make me throw up. I didn't want to see it. OK, I trained my body to reject it. Not even I couldn't even look at it for the longest time. So, um, well, years later, you know, I'm married to my third wife. I, I have a thirty dollar an hour job. Well, I get laid off. and she, I gave her like three thousand dollars to catch up the rent or, or whatever on her house because I just moved in there. We'd just been together for a little while. I said, just go pay the rent. Well, I, the landlady comes up to me one day and says, hands me an eviction notice. I'm like, I just paid you three thousand dollars. Why, why are you handing me this? And she said, she never gave me no money. I'm like, so we ended up getting moved out. Well, I had met some people through my job and I had. A lot of people that I knew that was, you know, into the meth and it wasn't any good things. Well, I ended up went in three weeks time, went from, you know, getting an eight ball of that stuff to let everybody try to. I was now pulling out two kilos a day selling it. Yeah. Well, Isn't it crazy years. how fast it just escalates? Well, it, and it did. And it had to for me because I had nine mouths to feed and I was laid off until March from September. At thirty dollars an hour, that's a lot of money a week. I was making over fifteen hundred dollars a week at the time doing construction, uh, commercial windows, and so March of two thousand eighteen, asked my ex-wife to go get the tags on the vehicle because they'd expired. Gave her the money. She goes up to the secretary of state office. She's gone for a couple of hours, and she comes back. And there's the yellow sticker. I didn't think nothing of it. We go out to Kalamazoo, make my normal run. We get. Back into town safely, get over to my brother's house. Well, he's not there. And I'm fine. I'm just so tired. She's just nagging at me. I said, just go back. Let's go back to the house. And she pulls out and we get down the road and we're like just a minute from home pulling. I told her pulling the gas station because we had to get gas anyway. And the cops pull in behind us. And I said, why are they pulling us over? You weren't speeding. You know, what's going on? They come up and they said, well, your, your plates are expired. And I looked at her and I said, what? And she said, she didn't, she just didn't say nothing. I said, I just looked up because I knew she, she, had, I don't even know where she got the sticker from, but she had that same color sticker for that year, but they, she didn't pay for them. She didn't go do what I asked her to. Yeah. Uh, so they pull us over and then they obviously I had a warrant for some ticket I hadn't paid out of, and then the, the 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 county that they called the county the county said it's more than 25 miles just advise and release you know tell them to come in and pay us we'll clear it up you know don't arrest him so i hear this over the loudspeaker and that cop says well since you have the warrant i gotta take an interim bond but you know you don't have to go out there i said they said advise and release <laughs> he said no i'm gonna just make you pay the interim bond if you say you have the money and i'm gonna book you i said okay well i can sit in my vehicle and book me well, he wasn't having it. He yanks me out of the truck and I forgot I had a, somebody give me some back that they didn't want anymore or whatever. And I, I stuck it in my pocket and forgot about it. My, never mind the fact that I just dropped off 35 ounces right before there. And I still had five ounces sitting under in a false bottom under the seat of her, her, the driver's side in a false yeah. bottom that I wasn't worried about because nobody's ever going to find that. Well, he pulls me out and I remembered that I had that in my pocket. I'm like, 
cat. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to jail anyway. Screw it. So but he looks at that. And he pulls me back to the car. He, they go up front and they act, they pretend like they're going to yank her out of the car. They were up there for a minute. And I'm flipping out, kicking the windows in the car because they're just grabbing her and throwing her all around. And I'm like, what the hell? He pulls out this big bag of, of you know, of course, of what it was the drugs. And he goes, what's this? And I said, I don't know. Where did you find that? <laughs> he said, well, it was under your seat. I said, I know there wasn't nothing under my seat. I said, if you noticed there was no trash under my on my side of the truck, I'd keep my truck clean. You yeah. Know? He said, oh, no, we found it under her seat. I said, no, you didn't. He wouldn't even open the bag. They didn't even test the stuff that was in my pocket. They just told me what it was. They kept us out there for four or five hours. Um, I was starting to get woozy because I hadn't eaten. They finally take us to jail. And they say they tested it at the police station. I'm like, you're supposed to test that in front of me. They did yeah. not. Um, so they kind of got hit for that. But they were also denying me a quarter point because they my checks I hadn't cashed. Said that I had a night, uh, you know, a twenty dollar an hour job, thirty with overtime. Well, I lost that job because it's on a school property. Now I have a fel pending felony. I can't be on that school, so I lost that job. They denied me three times. Finally, I had to hire a lawyer. And they were going to try to let me go through this trial because they thought they were going to have me dead rights because I would not tell the police anything about anybody. Uh, they tried to question me and I just wouldn't tell them nothing. And so they were going to give me six to 10 years on a first felony offense. Wow. Okay, wow. Now, in Michigan, to have a manufacturing delivery charge, you have to have three criteria out of four. They yeah. had one criteria. They ran it for a year. I fought it for a year. Finally, I just got tired of it. I said, just if you can get me anything better, I would sign a plea deal. Just let me get it over with. I just want to get it over with. Well, my lawyer fails to tell me that because they kept threatening me with a six to 10 if I didn't talk. And she had to tell him that, look, if he says anything, he won't even make it to court. So why are you even pushing this issue? You keep pushing that. I'm going to take it to trial and we will win because there's no fingerprints on nothing. It wasn't his area of control. It's not his technically. Yeah. Yeah. Come to find out when I got sentenced, they finally got a real sweet plea deal of two years to 20 years because uh, Michigan has truth in sentencing. So it's 100 percent minimums. And uh, so I said, you know, what? I'm tired of fighting. I'll take the plea deal. You know, I wish to God I had not have because I would have never went to prison if she had told me that about what he said and taken it to trial. Because I found out my lovely, wonderful ex-wife. As soon as the cops went up to her window, she had pulled out of the false bottom. Now, mind you, you had to reach over to the passenger side to open it and then lift her seat up, which was electronic, and then open the false bottom, grab it out. And she hands it to the cops and says, here, he told me to hang on to this. I didn't find this out for a year later. Oh, no. I was going to ask that, earlier if she was your third ex-wife. <laughs> yes, yes. And if I had known earlier that she had done that. That's when, as soon as they told me that, because my lawyer says, well, she didn't totally throw you under the bus. I said, what do you mean? She showed me the paper. I said, no, she totally threw me under the bus. She was trying to yeah. ease it up. So she thought I would retaliate. By the time I got out of prison, I said, you know what? I don't want nothing to happen to her. I don't want nothing to do with her because I started my healing journey in prison. Prison saved my life. Okay. Yeah. Um, between the county jail and prison. I'd been in there almost a year and a half, almost two years. Well, I got sent to their SAI because I found out I had cancer in prison, uh, which is uh, a boot camp. So I'm back in boot camp at 40 years old. <laughs> I didn't like it the first time. I wasn't going to like it this time. <laughs> um, but being your was, story is constantly like from one fire to another, from one absolutely. boiling pot to another. I don't know what the saying is. It's like from one, from the fire to the pot from the pot, the pot to the fire or whatever yeah. there's it's a saying one for. Chaotic situation after the other i mean yeah it was nothing and but that's that's i operated that way because that's what i knew best i mean when i was struggling you know everything good that i went through in life every time i made a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars a year i was doing stuff that i shouldn't have been doing that was not it was not helpful to anybody it was not i was ruining lives dealing these drugs to people I was ruining yeah. their life as much as I was ruining mine. When I got charged and I was fighting this case, there was a point in time I had pictures up on my TikTok that you can see uh, then and now of where I was doing six one gram shots of meth a day just to yeah. try to kill myself. My wife was cheating on me at the time and I knew it and it, I, I just wanted to die. I really, I put a loaded nine millimeter to my head that I loaded myself right in front of her, said to here, you want to keep putting me through this? This is what you want. And I pulled the trigger. It didn't go off. 
I walk outside, pull the trigger again, and then it goes off. It was the second time. You are here for a greater purpose. Right. There was a second time I put a loaded shotgun in my head that I thought was loaded. It was loaded the night before. Somebody had the idea that I was not in the right frame of mind and they unloaded it. And I pulled the trigger again and it didn't go off. <laughs> and he comes out and says, huh, I knew it. And I said, what? And he goes, I, that's why I unloaded that last night is because I knew something was up. Because I, oh, I yeah. would have done it right in front of everybody. There was a living room full of people and I didn't care. You know, I just at that point, I, I wanted to die. And, you know, I still, uh, you know, having the, these dark thoughts about death all the time because, you know, going through everything I've been through, there was nothing good that went through my mind. Nothing. I mean, you know, and, and, and any time a man came at me, like, you know, a grown man come at me, I, women and children, I, I can't harm them for nothing, you know. But grown men, if they come at me, I don't see them. I see my dad there, you know. Mm-hmm. And I for, Now, mind you, I forgave my dad, and I, I understood. And, you know, I, I, I never got to say goodbye to him. He died while I was in prison, so which really bothered me because he did step up and, and teach me a lot of things that uh, I was able to survive this world that I was in even after prison that had tried again to kill me. Um, so I'm in prison, and, you know, I'm nobody's called, nobody's written nothing i get sent to this sai i'm 90 days and i get to go home yeah okay i'm excited i shut my mouth i didn't now when i was in the military boot camp i was a sassy mouth son of a gun i had to do push-ups i did i won some stupid prizes for some stupid games let's a lot uh, let's put it that way when i got to the, the prison boot camp i had 25 year old corporals that could just stand there and scream in my face they never had to i had corporals there that dealt with me every day did not even know my name 90 days, I didn't say a word unless I had to say a word, unless I had to make it, because you had to speak just like in the military, and I already knew this stuff. I was in a bunk by myself. Everybody else had bunkies. They could get their beds done because they made you Santa bag and get, then get inspection ready, just like in the military. I could do it all by myself. And they're like, how are you doing this? I said, I've already been through this once. And I almost, I said, the first day I said, you know what? I can't do this. I'll just let them t- send me back to prison. I didn't like it the first time. I'm not going to like it this time. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they, I found out quick that they weren't going to let you do that because if you got that program, they may try to make sure you succeed. Um, so I went through 90 days of that, and everybody's like, you just don't say a word. I said, there's no point in talking. I said, it's about self-discipline. I got in trouble one time in there because I said something to somebody that just couldn't shut their mouths, and he had the court, the it was a captain. He had to, he had to uh, reprimand me. He made me stand at the position of attention for over two hours. And wow. he did it for he did it for the point that he wanted to show this room of 20 guys that I was in that I shared this room with and bunks that that self-discipline, you gotta have that in order to succeed in life. And he said, This man is 40 years old and hasn't budged an inch because he knows if I he's gonna have to start over if he does. He he said, I'm sure his nose is itching, he's got sweat pouring down his forehead, and he still stands stock still. He said, Some of you could learn a lesson. And then he said something else. He said, you know, just because you guys are in here, he said, you're not defined by what you did. You're defined by what you do with it after. And I mm-hmm. almost teared up. And I said, all right, shithead, fix your face. And he said, what did you say? I said, nothing, sir. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. He said, what did you say? I said, all right, shithead, fix your face. He goes, he goes, what branch? I said, I don't want to talk about it. I said, fair enough. He said, so you you were in, in, a, in a campaign? I said, Bosnia in 96. And he said, oh, he said, if I had to guess, you're probably like me and Army. Now, mind you, this man is like only 25 years old, still active duty military and getting ready to go back. And I said, again, I, I just don't want to talk about it. It's, you know, it's, it's hard for me to talk about. It. And he said, I get it. And he turned around and he said, I want you guys to understand something. He said, that man right there has seen things that you guys, you guys talk about, uh, you know, all the stuff you've done. He said, you couldn't imagine some of the things that man has seen and is just standing here doing it, you know, doing what he's supposed to. And mind you, this is the, one of the most asshole corporals that was there. Loved to mess everybody up. If one person failed, everybody failed. And I shook that man's hand at the end of it. And I said, you know what? I respect you because honest to God that, that these, a lot of these guys need someone like you, you know, in here to set them straight. I said, fortunately, I'm old enough to know that, Hey, I need to get myself straightened up. 
Uh, so I get out on parole. I have an 18 month parole, which they only have 24 months, go up to 24 months in Michigan. So that's the longest parole you get, which is hard to do. Zero tolerance. If somebody calls and says they seen you with a gun, you're going right back. They don't have to have proof. Wow. Six days after I get out, I called my ex-wife and I said, well, I, I said I wanted a divorce. She calls the cop, says I threatened her. I got 45 days in the Eaton County Jail and 90 days of tether for that. Zero tolerance. Oh, wow. I spent seven months out of those 18 on Tether because another time I saved three heroin addicts from dying. And because I was around drugs, I got put on Tether again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I did violate a couple of times, but it was technical violations. Thank God for Trump's no crime, no time, because I didn't get to I didn't have to go back. Um, However, I did start fight sex trafficking because I was I, I hated that. I hate it with a passion. I watched it happen to my mom in front of me. Um. And because I tried to stop their money flow, and I was literally kicking hotel doors in and pulling people I knew personally out of these hotels that were forced to do it. That's the thing that I don't think people realize with human trafficking is that a lot of times they're forced into it or they're bribed into it with drugs. Like, if you want these drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah like a boyfriend or something and it, and it's white collar mm-hmm. people it's judges doctors there's some cops i found we're doing it got people that dress nicely you know will date a, a girl that's you know got low self-esteem you know start sharing drugs with her and groom her say hey why don't you do this for me make us a little bit of money honey we need to catch up you know if you love me you'll do this they groom them they even have women grooming these girls pretending to be friends and then they're giving them this methamphetamine mixed with fentanyl so they get they get that euphoric rush, and then they get that hooked on that fentanyl, and then they zombify so they can do what they have to do in the hotels, and they're not getting paid for it. They're treated like crap. Well, yeah. I was I had my B12 for my cancer to give me energy. Somebody decided that it was time for me to go because I was I was doing too much damage control. <laughs> they were trying to do damage control because they were losing a lot of money because of me. Yeah. Uh, and mind you, this was a house that I was living in. These people were part of this, and I didn't know it at the time. They swapped my B12 with an arsenic laced heroin shot. I put mm-hmm. it in my hip like I normally did. And the next thing I know, I had people hitting me, waking me up. And there's the cops, there's uh, paramedics. Mind you, I'm still five months out from parole, uh, being off parole. Wow. I'm thinking, oh my God, my parole officer is going to find this out, and I'm going back, you know. Luckily, the hospital didn't report nothing. They did call the cops because they, when they found the arsenic in my system, they said, somebody tried to kill you. We have to report it. Yeah. After an eight-hour Narcan drip, I looked at that police officer and said, I'm under arrest. He said, no, I just need some questions from me. I looked at the doctor and said, am I free to go? He said, yep. I said, looked at that, back at the officer. I said, first one to get him wins. And I walked out of that hospital. That doctor goes, that man should be downstairs in the morning, not walking out of this hospital. He goes, I... That's a bad man. He goes, I would never want to cross him. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? He goes, he put four Narcan shots at home and an eight-hour Narcan drip here. And he's yeah. working out in the hospital. He had that much fentanyl-based heroin in his system and arsenic. He said, I'll show you the results. He should be dead. So I, I realized at that point, I'm like, all right, now I know that I'm here for a reason. Um, all my stuff was stolen. My Harley was stolen. My kids' Christmas presents were stolen. My retirement accounts that had hundreds of thousands of dollars in them from that job was stolen. I said, okay. So I started going after people by myself, one by one. And they got so scared, they were calling the cops on me. They were calling my associates and other organizations saying, hey, can you stop this guy? And they're like, hey, you did it. <laughs> we can't yeah. do nothing about this. Guy. He's he's we, we don't even mess with him like that. What are you thinking? You know? Um, <laughs> One of my brothers says, hey, get out of here. You're going to go back to prison. I said, he goes, promise me you will not do anything to go back to prison. I said, you're a jerk. Because I can't, I can't, he made me promise I can't go back on my word. So I said, then you better deal with it for me. Two, two days later, I got off parole. I left for Florida. I moved to Florida. Stayed there for a few months. I came back to Michigan to help a buddy work. I wasn't getting paid. I met somebody. I was moving back that way anyway. I ended up in Georgia for seven months. The relationship got really toxic and I started noticing all this stuff because I've been transforming. And I'm like, I can't do this. I I'm, I need my peace. I, I left in the pouring rain, no clothes, left all my stuff there. 
my buddy came down a week later, picked me up in a semi from Michigan and in Savannah, and we went to Savannah, Georgia. We stayed on the truck with him for a month down in Florida. And then he dropped me off in Kentucky last year in April. And I said, I'm done. I, I, I need to get myself together. I found a job right away. I was making 22 bucks an hour, but I hated the job. I hated that job with a passion. It was factory work. It was hot. Dealing with fiberglass. Oh, yeah. It was miserable. Okay. Yeah. But the job paid well. I had my apartment now that I still, you know, paid for. I've, you know, furnished it all myself. I built my bed. I, I mean, I have a 60-inch computer monitor. That, it's a TV that I use for a computer monitor. Okay. I haven't had nothing like this in five years. So I'm I'm ecstatic about it. I made uh, $45,000 in 10 months last year. And I th that's how I did all this. And well, come January, because of my PTSD, I took a half day vacation day when we come back, like at the end of the week, they were a little upset about it. Uh, they gave me one point and they said it put me over the points and fired me while I come to find out. I, I have an EEOC case with concerning that anyway now. So, um, which they called me back within an hour the other day and set up my interview. So. I'm probably, there's probably going to be an investigation, but anyway, that's neither here nor there, but I knew I wasn't happy. So when they let me go, I was like, I'm not upset. I'm not going to be making the same. I'm not going to be making $1,500 a week anymore, but I'm not upset. So what am I going to do? And I sat here for January and February, you know, get my employment together, trying to get that going. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do now? Mind you, I started the life coach uh, master course in December. Hadn't really done, but one, uh, one certification by this point but when march hit i said i'm finishing this deal and you had to go through every video 100 percent. you had it was a self-study so i had to oh, do yeah. every word thing, you know so that's what i why i use as my credibility i had to sit here and discipline myself to do every worksheet and apply it to myself so everything i teach my people is the same thing i went through okay? yeah and, and it's not them. easy i i no. had someone tell me one day like people pay you that much money to just be their sober buddy. And I'm like, I'm not just a sober buddy. I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and two certifications as a professional coach and as an addiction coach. I'm like, I've spent thousands of dollars, yes. like tens of like hundreds of thousands of dollars on my education. It's not easy the, no. the training, like the, the coach training alone is hard. It's my certification it, cost me $500. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, that was for the master. That's how I got the master coach was doing all mm -hmm. four certifications. I got the master coach. That was $500. Now, mind you, I'm also taking right now because I have a background in uh, psychology. When I was in the military, I did counterintelligence. So mm -hmm. I had that dark manipulative psychology I knew. So I knew psychology, but I can't use that as credentials because I was administratively separated. There's, you know, yeah. They, they fired me. The army fired me. So I cannot use my credentials. So now I'm thinking, well, I can't, I don't want to go be a counselor because I'll get sued because I'm brutally honest. I tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And some people whine too much and I will tell them that. So I probably get sued. So I can't be a counselor. <laughs> okay. They have their place. We work well with them, but I can be a yes. life coach because I can motivate the hell out of somebody say, Hey, you're screwing up. Let's get this going. Let's be accountable. Yeah. Let's, Let's get, make a okay. plan to move forward. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I, I have some coach. clients that do that. They'll be like, well, I just so you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm still seeing my therapist, or they'll you you know they'll kind of tiptoe around it, and I'm like, no, I really? encourage my clients Absolutely. to have a coach and a therapist, and I'm actually getting a second master's so that I can get my therapy license in Texas because my the plan was like my master's program in 2019 mm -hmm. um it it made me eligible to apply for the LPC in Texas. However, I waited two years and the credentials changed, the requirements changed, and yeah. now you need 62 hours instead of 48. And so I have basically have to go, yeah. yeah, You and your internship has to be specifically in counseling. So I basically yeah. have to get a whole new master's program. So I'm going to Texas Tech and getting the addiction counseling uh, master's you know over there. You know what's funny about that? And, I, and I've got to say this because I still have my SOP manual that I learned in the Army. It's called the Human Resources Exploitation Manual. Okay. <laughs> what, what do you call the job, the, the, the department that hires you in a job? 
human resources. Okay. There, there's a big correlation there. Okay. So understand that I know psychology. Okay. Yeah. I know psychology. All right. I'm still taking a diploma right now. I've got to take my final exam. On, I'm doing it online again as another self-study to get a diploma in psychology because yeah. to back up my life, uh, Coach certifications that way I have yeah. something eventually I will probably go get my licensing that way if I need to have fall back on a counselor like a substance abuse counseling position I can um, I have applied for some jobs at a mental health and substance abuse place as a peer support specialist mm-hmm. you know because that's the same thing uh, but yep. you know I, I really just am interested in starting my own business and that's what I did in March I said you know what? I got to buckle down this is what I want to do I finished the certifications and then I said, you know what, I'm gonna, I need to write all this down because I need to get this story out. So I wrote my first book, the, From the Streets to Redemption, Choosing to Live When the World Wants You to Die. That's about my growing up, you know, without the gory details, but you get the gist of it. It's it's impactful. It's only 63 pages. People have short yeah. attention spans these days. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was in April. In May, I said, I can't sleep one night. And Dr. Wayne Dyer does this. He said he get. He said it's when the universe aligns with him. He can't sleep. So he gets up and writes. I got up one night at 11 p.m. I knew I wasn't going to sleep. And I sat here till 11 a.m. the next day. And I hammered out this next book, which I just published in uh, May called How to Find Times in the, or How to Find Happiness in the Worst Possible Times. And with including the science behind it, I even include Joel and Natalie from the Transformation Academy. They're the, how who they taught, you know, because that's their course I went through and included all the science to back up everything. And I let a guy. But work read one. He said, I love it when you say you might have a, just a barely a roof over your head with roaches and ramen noodles, but you and a and a cot to sleep on. He goes, But you still gotta be grateful because you got something to live in. I said, Hey, I've lived that way recently. <laughs> so yes. I'm always grateful. Yeah. You know, I, it's just to show people that you it, gratitude, attitude, smiling, and forgiveness are the four basic components that you can make yourself happy. You don't need nobody else to do that. Okay. Yeah. I'm 45 years old. I'm a single man. I spend 90% of my time alone and I'm okay with it. Cause when somebody comes around and mess with my piece, I tell them, get the hell out of my house. Yeah. You can come back later, but don't you mess with my piece. Go on. Yes. Yes. And yes. I've done that with family too. Yeah. I have family. Cause this, this is a question that comes up. Well, how do you deal with family that's toxic? I'll tell you, love them from a distance. I have family that I love that's in Michigan. I will never speak to them again for what they did to me, but I don't want nothing to happen to them. I still love them. I can love them from way out here in Kentucky and Georgia and in the South. They can stay their butts up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did it. You don't have my... to have people, toxic people in your life because the first place to relapse is toxicity. That's the yes. quickest way to relapse right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's <clears throat> what I do with my, my coaching clients is I try to identify toxic things mm-hmm. in their life. Like what, raises your stress level what upsets you like what brings you down what you know what are the things that push you over the edge from happy to uncomfortable to stress and see and that's where it gets uncomfortable because people don't understand it you know they they're like oh i don't want to face that okay that's understandable that's why we send you still the counselors and therapists but uh you know, I'm leaning more towards this whole positive psychology thing. I think it works better. So that I might still go back and get my licensing just for that because I like the idea of positive psychology. It works better because most counselors, they focus on what was wrong in the past, which you have to do. Yeah. You have to face that. OK, you, you don't face that to look back and stay in the past because we already stay in the past too much as it is as people. Um, what you have to do that is to be self-aware and learn how to because you're going to have to face it. So you're going to have to identify it so you had to go back and face it to see what it is that happened that you you know you're Mm -hmm. why you're the way you are secondly you're gonna have to trigger yourself and it's called anchoring trigger yourself to the point of almost over the edge to where you react and then bring yourself down you have to learn how to where your points are is once you have that right there you literally all you got to do is change how you think because your thoughts create emotions that create behaviors yeah once you identify those points what makes you, what doesn't serve you and what's triggering you, get that crap out of your life and replace it with empowering stuff Something and people, good. Yeah. things, and then everything changes. Your whole life will change just by changing those little few things. And mm-hmm. it's not that hard there, not that difficult. All it takes is that little step. Yeah. Because yeah. when we, we seek happiness from the, from outside sources, you're not finding happiness. You're relying on everybody else. Mm-hmm. And I, for a long time, I under, couldn't understand why some everybody said, well, you got to be happy with you before you can make anybody else happy. I'm like, what the hell does that stupid mean? Yeah, you your happiness has to, to come. 
Yeah, your happiness has to come from within. Like you have to be able right. to be happy in the crappiest of places. Like I tell my daughter all the time, I'm like, when I found out I was pregnant, I lived in the trailer park where I had used more drugs than any place in Lubbock. Like I, that my mom randomly decided to move her trailer to that trailer park, even though I told her she couldn't <laughs> because you don't shit. I where think you I eat. know that trailer park because I think we lived there when I was a kid. <laughs> I honestly believe I think Probably I know that. Trailer park. Yeah. Probably one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, you cannot, because you don't shit where you eat, right? So I'm like, you can't move Thank your you. trailer to that trailer park. And she wanted to know why. I'm like, you just can't move it there. Well, when I got sober, she lived there and I met my daughter's dad there. And so when I found out I was pregnant, I was living in the trailer park where I had done more drugs in my life than I'd done anywhere else in a trailer that had holes in the floor, holes in the wall, no AC hardly like barely running water like we you know it was mouse infested but I was happy because I was sober and I was moving towards something and now we live in one of the most sought after neighborhoods in Dallas and my daughter has a car she has she, we, she can go to the store and buy whatever she wants you know like we don't worry for those things anymore right. but I tell her I'm like you have got to be able to be happy though in the trailer park with the holes in the floor or in your nice cushy house I'm gonna tell you this much uh I, I have a lot of friends that from high school in New Mexico that uh live in Dallas now and they they you know they've done well for themselves and I'm proud of, and happy for them because you know I didn't have the same opportunities that people did like like I'll give you an example my mom was a rebel uh her two younger sisters were 13 11 when I was born so they grew up and did what my grandmother asked them to my middle aunt is a, a master psychologist herself she's written a book called blue eyed uh Black Eye, Blue Sky. Um, she's very successful. Her husband, her two kids are both in Nashville. My uh, The older one is a licensing manager for ASCAP and producing his little sister's music. So I'm proud of all of them. I'm glad they, they worked hard. I wasn't afforded those same opportunities, but I always said, I will make it through anything. I've proven this time and time again. I can make my own way. I don't need anybody because of everything I've been through. I've learned how to make something out of nothing. And I'll tell you, when I hit... I'm, I hit last September in 2022, my, uh, one of my brothers killed himself and that hit me hard. And that's, I still hadn't found that happiness from within. I couldn't figure out how to find that happiness in just any situation, you know, except for just to try to be positive. Well, when he killed himself and I took one day off work and I, I meditated, I prayed, I'm like, what is going on here? And I got the answer I needed that, Hey, I found the peace that he wasn't hurting no more that, you know, he, cause nobody knew found the peace in that situation knowing that he was feeling better he was free and it made me feel better and i'm like that's the answer right there that that is it nothing is going to bother me that i can't control anymore i can't control it can't change it it's not going to bother me it's not going to affect me okay i have the ch choice of how to react to this okay and by me reacting negatively and that's just bringing out it's like a but I say shit rolls downhill. That's very true because that's what happens. You know, you lose your keys in the morning, you get stuck in traffic, everything goes haywire because you're attracting all that negative attention. Mm -hmm. But if you flip the script, yes. yeah. Okay, so positive, I'm starting to be positive. And I'm thinking, okay, now I'm doing these certifications. I'm like, this is all coming together. It's making sense. I wrote these books and I'm like, I got to write something on happiness. And, and I did. And, you know, my first book has sold a lot more copies than the second one, but that's because I haven't really promoted the second one because I'm waiting. Uh, that's part of my coaching program. Is if you, I have a, a program where, it, you, you know, Finding the Happiness Now program, it's, a, you know, like a 12-week program. And if people purchase that package, I, I will order it them a copy of that book for free because it follows right along with the same concepts you know the book's worded a lot differently but it, it follows the same the limiting beliefs the, the you know the mood the time the you know the triggers and wires you know everything you know the desire it follows all those six steps and that's what it literally is a six steps but the main important one is limiting beliefs people don't even understand how much our childhood influence our lives now okay like, you know, here's a good one that I like to use all the time that money doesn't grow on trees. 
Well, first of all, yes, it does because it's made of paper. <laughs> okay. Right. It, it may not be the same kind of paper, but it's still made out of trees. Okay. Right, right, right. Um, but we have all, that limiting belief that there is not, that there is a money. limit on the money that we can have. Yes. Yeah. So and we, you we don't want for what you want. Yeah. Because yes. we grew up with a scarcity mindset of like, there's yes. never enough. There's not ever going to be enough. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You hit it right on the head. But yeah. when I did the research, there is enough money in this world for everybody in the world to be rich. Mm -hmm. There really is. Okay, so why are we not all doing this? I said, okay, I'm going to take this. I've taken the entrepreneurial road before I've owned my own businesses, but it was in fields that I knew everything about the field. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew how to run the business. This I didn't know nothing about. I stepped yeah. into a world. Marketing is not my strong point at all. I will be honest with you. I could sell I could sell ice water to the devil. Okay. I could charm the panties off a snake. Marketing, I'm lost. Okay. I'm getting there, but um, it's I a will whole tell another you, beast all its own. I would tell you, though, that I have completely done everything I've done except for my LLC, which was $40 a Secretary of State, and two Facebook ads I've run. I've spent no money but that 40, 50 bucks up till this now i'm getting to where i have to start spending money soon but i started with no capital no loans no help i built everything my social media is all monetized i built this following i've written these two books published them and made money off of them without spending a dime out of my pocket and it's not been easy i've had to do a lot of research i've started something had to go back and redo it but i'll mm -hmm. tell you what chat gpt has become my best friend <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> I, I did not I did not use it to write my books. I wrote those naturally. I did run it yeah. through there to uh, get feedback Enhance as it, if yeah. you say, you know, is this good enough for the, an audience? And I got, you know, great reviews from it. I use it like I, I will put in the prompt when I make a prompt, I'll put in every detail that I need and I'm, everything out of my mind. All it does is writes it out for me real quick. So I ain't got to spend hours doing it. It right. writes it in about 30 seconds. Yeah. So I save so much time with that, that. It's amazing. I'm getting ready to pay the 20 bucks a month for the upgraded because it saves me that much time. Because without that, I, I would I would be still six months behind where I'm at now. Yeah, okay. no, I have um, I have the upgraded version. Highly suggest it. I think you said something about looking at my website. Was it you that said you looked at my website? I have because I do look at everybody. I look into all their stuff. I haven't looked into it detailed, but I yeah. I did get some ideas from your website. Yes, yeah. I did. Uh, yeah. Good ones. I so I put into Chat GPT like um, top phrases for sober coaches, and so that mm -hmm. really helped gave me like an outline of what to include on my website. So yeah, like Chat GPT is. Well, and here's the thing. I tried Shopify too because I I have a merch line that I'm trying that's going to back up my uh my whole coaching my whole mission because my my mission is to save lives because here's some statistics. 90, 1992 we had less than 6,000 opioid deaths, okay? Uh 2012 there was 30,000. By 2022 we had 107,900 opioid related deaths alone in the United States. That is astronomical. We are not talking about this enough. And so I put up a poll on Alignable. I'm part of that community as well. I want to know from people, and I'll I'll put it out here. I want to know from people that have never experienced drugs, never experienced addiction, never had family. Doesn't, you know, I want to know what their idea of it is because there needs to be some education first. Because yeah. When it hits your home and you don't really know the true definition, because we're still locking up our drug addicts. I got locked up when I put myself to rehab. I knew I needed the help. I put myself through this before the court. The courts never asked me to. They still sent me to prison. You know what I learned in prison? I didn't learn. I, well, I made sure that I told myself I'm going to start transforming and healing myself. But I didn't learn reform in prison. I learned how to be a better criminal in there. It's That's a crime insane. school. It is not, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. you cannot lock up people that have diseases, that have trauma, that some of them people are begging for help. Yeah, they really are. They really and you're are. Throwing right back to those dealers. You're throwing, you're throwing your kids out to these dealers yeah. because you say they don't want to change their life. Hug them tightly and get rid of the people giving them this shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't think there's enough education out there on what addiction really looks like. And my daughter is a teenager. Yeah, that's why yeah. I'm gonna hit TEDx because Ditto. That, but that they need us world. out there. They need more of yes. us out there. <laughs> and, and I don't you know look what? like a traditional drug addict, right? Like people, they, my daughter's friends, they're like, your mom. They'll listen to my podcast because her friends all follow me on Instagram, and they're like, your mom did hard drugs. 
Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I tell people all the time, I shot up for 26 years. You cannot tell I don't have a track mark one because I took care of myself. Yeah. You know? It doesn't but, look like what you think it looks like. We're no. not always bums on the side of the road shooting up under an overpass. Like that's well, not always fact, it. When I was in Georgia, the lady I was dating, her kid said, I can tell a meth head any day of the week they act all crazy and stuff. Well, little did he know that because of our toxic relationship, I got back into the drugs for a little while and he never knew the difference. I can, yeah. you know, because I went to work, I did it. I said, you don't really know because that's how closed minded this world is. And that's just an example. Now, I've been clean for a year and a half now, almost two years now. So, you know, I, I'm re- I'm proud of that, you know, because that's a daily struggle because yes. there's a lot of stressors in my life still that I just, you know, I tend to blow off or I go meditate. But that would be so easy just because my mind goes 90 to nothing. I can't shut up half the time. And that's oh. somebody asked me the other day, said, are you high? I said, no, this is what I'm like sober. I yeah. said, when I'm high, I don't say much. I just sit it's down. It's the and opposite. Focus. Yeah. 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 I said, yeah. you give me Xanax. And I said, I, and I'll chase the police down the road. I'll put back stuff I never stole. It has the opposite effect. Okay. <laughs> and, I, and I have done both of those. I've chased the police on Xanax and I've and I put back stuff I didn't steal. The store's like, what are you doing, sir? I said, putting this back. So it was outside. And they're like, we don't even sell that here. I'm like, oh, whoops. I slapped a gator thinking I slapped a gator in Florida, not realizing it, but yeah, me and Xanax don't get along. We don't, I used to be on 30 psych meds. I don't take none of them because I don't like not being in control of my body. That's why I quit doing drugs. Well, I I don't like not being in control. Yeah. Um, I broke a million dollar open MRI machine trying to get an MRI of my knee because they gave me Xanax and I told them not to because they thought it was going to calm me down. No, opposite. (laughs) Yeah, they had to replace a million dollar open MRI machine. Wow. <laughs> I said, please wow. do not give me Xanax. <laughs> and they said, here, just it, no, it's a valium. I took that pill and I started saying, that ain't no valium. That yeah. ain't no valium. My heart started racing. And I said, get me out of here. I'm claustrophobic. I started punching that thing, kicking. I busted every bit of it I could on um, the way out. <laughs> we need to listen to people when they say they can't take a certain thing. We know what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put the links to okay. your books in the in the notes and yes. your um all of your social media, TikTok. You sent and me all the things. What I asked you the other day, I, I, I sorry I didn't get back to you on uh, Messenger. Is that if, if I, I'll say it now I'm here? If if there's anybody you know, like beyond your coaching clients that needs help that just doesn't have the money to pay for it, send them to me because I'll do some free stuff. Uh, money's not an issue with me right yeah. now because the message to me is more important. Helping is more important. Yes, I do need to get paid, but I, I would rather have a testimony right now because I am a new coach. Yeah. Um, gaining credibility. I'd rather have the testimony. So if there's anybody out there that, you know, maybe that you if overflow, because I would never step on your toes. But if you know somebody, because I can do virtual that needs yeah. help, that they can't pay, send them right to me. I'll be glad yeah. to help. Yeah. And that's a great place for our listeners to hear it because there are a lot of people out there who need the help and traditional counseling hasn't worked for them. Traditional rehab hasn't worked for them. They really need someone that they can talk to who can walk through early recovery with them without judgment, without feeling ashamed, without feeling like if they do relapse and fail that they're going to be judged for it. Like, and I think that's a really amazing part of coaching is that we really and, are walking with them and being as i was a diplomat when i was in the crime world and in organizations i did a lot of politics because i was good with talking things down with people uh, mm-hmm. i could talk to people without humiliating them uh, mm-hmm. making them understand even constructively criticizing them without making them feel ashamed of, and, and empowering them still and saying hey you got this you just got to switch something up a little bit you know they, you know i don't ever shame anybody they don't have to be humiliated i can talk to someone uh, and even in people that are slacking off, I can put them in their place without ever raising my voice or or harming them in any way and say, look, let's 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 just get this right, because this ain't going to serve any of us. And it's just all we're going to do is end up in a, in a worse situation. So let's let's just work together and get it right. You know, um, I, I'm just very passionate, though, about saving people's lives, because just two months ago, I lost another buddy to heroin and everybody but one person. My other friend, she stayed there by his side trying to help him while everybody else ran out and let him die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you could leave the listeners with one last message, what would it be? There is hope. If I can change, anybody can change. Okay. I was a career criminal. I've done prison time. I was severely beaten. I've done some nasty things to people myself. 
that I'm not proud of that I have to answer for. If I can change my life, you can change yours. Just reach out to somebody because there's a, too many people hiding in the shadows, afraid because of the stigma or they're, you know, feel like they're burdened. You're not. That's why we do this. This is why, because we have that experience. We know we've done this. We've done our work. We are the best option to help you because a doctor can't help you better than we can. They've never done this. They've never been there. We know what it's like to have those feelings of despair, darkness, wanting to die. We know that. Okay. We've been there. We've done the work. We can't help. You know, we're, we're the people that have been drug addicts and changed their life. They're the best. That's why they make the best substance abuse counselors Mm -hmm. because they've been there. So yeah. just reach out. Uh, everything I have, you, like you said, you'll post all my social medias, my website. I, I use Life Coach Hub as well as the software because it's easier for me. Um, yeah. But even if you can't pay for the packages, just call me personally or email me. And I will work something out to where we can make something happen and you can get the help you need. Awesome. Money is never an issue with me. Just reach out. I would rather help you first and worry about the rest later. Yeah, I'll always be okay, but you're not if you're still doing those drugs, especially heroin. Yeah, you're not safe, and I, that's that's a passion for me. It's why I get up in, every day. It's what drives me to do this is to save some lives. So yeah, don't don't be afraid to reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your thank story. You. Thank you. It for was being wonderful. Here. Thank you so much. And, Yes. You know, I appreciate it. And I, it's, it's humbling. It really is just to, I feel grateful. And, you know, it, it humbles me to be able to serve other people for once, you know, instead of taking from other people and be being a thug and, and a, a bad person, because I wasn't always a good person that I get to live that fulfilling life now because I, I feel wealthy already. You know, entrepreneurism, they say these people out there don't people let's get it right people that say that you can do it in four hours a day and you scale to 100,000 in 90 days they're lying to you it takes a long time there's a lot of uncertainty you stay broke a long time but it is so rewarding that once you feel that you will never ever go back to a regular night I I have recently just to pay the bills but I still keep on my business I keep going because I will never give this up it is so much freer to be able to sit on my butt at home and do what I want to do. I can sit in my underwear and, and, and uh, write a book if I want to. I, <laughs> I know there's a little much information, but <laughs> hey, you know what? I can do what I want. Ain't nobody telling me, hey, you got to go over here. You got to be here at this time. No, I yep. don't, buddy. Yeah. If I don't make money, it's my own fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, thanks for listening this week. And until next week, be well, be kind, and may you find some. Be well, be kind, and may you find some joy this week. Stay positive. (laughs) Thanks. Thank you. You have a good one.